All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Raspberry Pi, gaming devices. I, I brought a toy for us to play with, which we'll pull out in just a sec. Actually, no, we're going to pull it out now cause, because we can. All right, so this guy is a um, homemade um, Game Boy of sorts. So it plays, it plays classic Super Nintendo games. Did anyone have it? Or classic NES games. Anyone have a Nintendo emulation? Okay, a bunch of you guys. Um, in my opinion, the classic 8-bit gaming systems beat beat all the modern games, hands down. Because at that time, the, the guys who were writing the programs were also designing the games. Like, you didn't have these massive 100-person staff teams with dedicated artists and dedicated storyboarders and dedicated stuff. You just had, like, brilliant people doing the whole thing. So I think, I think that's the way to do games. And, of course, you know, classic Super Mario. So if you want to give it a try, I'll pass it around. I'm going to explain that. <laughs> I'm going to explain how. But it's entirely, entirely homegrown, and it runs Java. Um, so this is my this is my day job. I'm the Java community manager. I manage the the Java Twitter handle, as you guys saw, which I was um, tweeting on a little bit earlier. 314 Java user groups. Anyone a Jug member? Uh, so everyone else is asleep. It's okay. Um, Nine million Java developers, 150 Java champions, and then 50 of the jugs are also JCP contributors. Are, is is this jug a JCP contributor? Okay, okay. We want to get this number higher. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When you're when you're done, I'll increment the number. <laughs> but I, those are hard. But you know, I think it's even harder to create video games. We we need our cool retro. Oh no, that's not going to work. Okay. We get no sound. Sorry. <laughs> we we have a loop in the sound. Hold on, let me think about this. Do, 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 do. Uh, I know how to break the loop. Just a sec. This kill that. No more loop. Uh, okay. Now we get now we get sound effects. All right. So I think doing game emulation is actually really. I mean, even even harder job than being a community manager is hard, but this is an even harder job. So the, the NES is one of the most successful consoles in history. It kind of revived the video game industry back in the eighties? Eighties, yeah. Probably. What? Late eighties, yeah. Um there were sixty one million units sold worldwide. This included the Super Famcom, which it was called in Japan, the red, funky red units. It included the um Silver cases, which is what the U.S. and Europe got. Um, we got NTSC. I think you guys got PAL here. And there were 826 ROMs plus a bunch of homebrew ROMs created. So there's actually a lot of games. And these games were very inventive in their use of the hardware. Um, the hardware had a pixel processing unit, or PPU. It had a, an APU, an audio processing unit. And it had a, a, um, a um, CPU as well. Which was a you know based off an a early Motorola chip, 68,000 Motorola, Motorola chip, with the um, floating point units stripped off, I believe. Um, so it wasn't the most complicated hardware, but the they would use interactions between the chips, which ran at different clock rates, to do all sorts of tricks with the game. Um, so you'd have crazy things like you know doing like parallel side scrolling and all sorts of like weird tricks they would do because they would rewrite things in the middle of a line by using registers on different chips and use all these little timing effects to get things working. So doing really accurate synchronization of um, these gaming systems is very hard. So there's you know something like 92 million synchronization points. It basically ends up forcing your code to be mostly single-threaded if you want to have accurate emulation. Because if you try to parallelize it across threads, you lose all your performance with um, keeping multiple threads in sync. So it's it's quite quite a challenge to do like a very accurate simulation and have it run and be high performance. Um, and of course, the it's very challenging to test all of the the games. So you need to spend a lot of time playing video games, which I know I know is a very tedious process. Has anyone played this one? Ninja Gaiden? No. So this is top five hardest games of all time. I think 
I left my console on for two weeks to beat it because, of course, um, every time you shut off the console, you start from the beginning. And the end levels were evil enough that you had to play them hundreds of times to beat the game. Like, you just had to memorize where the enemies jumped out, where the funky pits were which you would fall into, the attack pattern of the big boss, and then after you beat him, he revived. You, the second attack pattern of his revived big boss, and then you beat that, and you're like, yes! And he revives again. <laughs> and then that's like, that's like two weeks later, you finally beat it, and you know, your mom... Your mom yells at you for wasting electricity. Um, Mega Man was also pretty hard, but Mega Man 1 was impossible because it was horribly imbalanced. So that's, that's another great feature of early games. This actually wasn't an NES game. This was an SNES game, but the shooters are also horrendously horrible. This is a Konami shooter, Gradius, I believe. And um, after this, I reached Nirvana for gaming. Anyone know what this is? Ah. What is this? Very good. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna challenge you to a gaming competition. Pass the console up here. <laughs> Somebody's in the second level. I can hear it. <laughs> Pass it to this guy. Okay, let me let me let me get, do a little reset on it. The oh, by the way, um, don't don't power off the console because you it's a Raspberry Pi. We should shut it down cleanly. Um, if you want to get into other games, you can press Start and Select simultaneously to get the menus. And then you can reset or load the game. Okay, so I've, I've reset it to the beginning. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do a speed run for the first level and see who who wins. Right? <laughs> um, I think that's that's only appropriate. Okay, let me see. Yeah, people on the live stream can can now read my email. It's wonderful. Um, okay, so this is this is my actual work computer with all my my junk on it, but you can you can see last thing I was using IoT surfboards and um, with Venetius in Switzerland that was a lot of fun. And I also have the NES code base. One one of these projects is the right one. We'll just we'll just try. It sounds like you're already playing. Are you are you, are you cheating? Are you getting a heads? No, no. Okay, you're just waiting for me to get in the game. All right, we need somebody to to count down and say when it's when it's okay to start. All right, ready? Say so count re count down to one. All right, three, count down and two, say go. One, go. All right. Which which is the run button? Oh man. C X. Yeah. Okay. This is the first level. Just run. Ah, I found jump. That's helpful. Anyone remember the secret? Ah! <laughs> yeah, so right right before that pit, there's a wonderful secret, but I think that's not quite halfway through the stage. Yeah, it's right before the... Um, I'm going to get the, the secret one up this time. Okay, I think, I think, I think we have a winner. Give him a big round of applause. All right, so 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 what do you think? Controls work fairly well. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Okay, so give him a prize or two for beating me and being a better gamer than me. So this is this is the desktop version I'm running, of course. And you guys are playing with the console version. See, no, no. Okay, we'll just. There we go. So you're probably wondering, well, you, you already asked this. How, how do we? How can you build one of these yourself, or how did I build it? Um, so this is the the finished model. The, the the first night, we got we got it working, got it assembled, in the case. Um, this is my daughter playing playing Mario. Um, her first time playing the original NES Mario. She'd played like later incarnations of Mario, which are are cute, but they're not nearly as challenging. Lots of um, gratification and making making kids happy. All right. So inside of this this case is a Raspberry Pi. It's a Raspberry Pi two. Does anyone know what the latest Raspberry Pi is? All right. Somebody new. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. It just came out. Give give them something. It it has Wi-Fi. It has 
Bluetooth. It has a 1.2 gigahertz quad core processor, which is crazy fast. The Raspberry Pi um, 2 was 900. Um, what, what else is new? There's, there was one other new thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, it's an ARM V8. The the GPU is faster as well on those. They bumped the GPU core up to 300 as well, I think. Anyway, so get a Raspberry Pi 3 if you can. They're sold out. <laughs> but the Raspberry Pi 2 is, is quite good as well, and that's what I used in here. Um, the Raspberry Pi, for those of you who don't have one yet, it's a $35 microcomputer. There's no excuse not to own several. Um, Ethernet port, USB ports, you power it via micro USB. The later Raspberry Pis are more power efficient, so you can actually power them off your laptop or a standard 500 megahertz plug. The older ones sucked a little more power, so you might want a one amp or two amp power supply. And if you hook up a bunch of stuff to USB, you need more power, obviously. Um, the newer ones use micro SD, not full size SD cards. The, what sets it apart from a general purpose computer is the GPIO pins. So that's how you hook up electronics. and um, most of them are like on-off pins. Well, all of them are on-off pins. Some of them are power, some are uh, grounds, but all the active pins are on-off. But there's a few of them which have special purposes. So there's UART, which is, what's UART? Anyone know? UART? Okay, serial. That's your serial connector, RS-232. There's also um, SPI. Anyone know what SPI is? Ah, what's SPI? Yeah, I, I think it's mostly used in, in cars as a bus system to communicate between different systems. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. So, yeah, so yeah, S it's, it's a bus system. SPI, it's a, it's a serial interface, but it's a, yeah. it's a bi-directional serial interface. Like standard serial is like one direction at a time, and it's a higher speed version of the same thing. Has more, it uses more pins as well. It uses, I think, five pins, including ground and power. So there's three data transmission pins. Uh, there's also I squared C, which uses four pins, and that's another bus type thing. I squared C is actually the most common one. Yeah, yeah okay, you see, you probably were thinking of I squared C. Um, yeah, SPI is faster than I squared C, but I think it's just device to device communication like serial. Um, so you have you know, UART and SPI and all this all this great fun stuff that you can do. But you can also turn them on and off to control devices, you can read sensors, and you get these wonderful ports on top. Anyone know what these ports are? Yeah, camera? Okay, one prize. Second, yeah. Display, yes, two prizes. All right. You can grab more stuff out of the bag too. Okay, so um, yes, these two are great. And so the display is great. The Raspberry Pi Foundation put out a seven inch um, LCD display. It's wonderful, it's rugged, it has like a big metal backing plate and then it has this extra huge metal thing with risers you stick your Raspberry Pi on and the daughter board is humongous, almost as big as the Pi as, w as well, it's wonderful. Not so great for a portable device. Um, the cam the cameras actually are a lot more portable. Those are cute. Actually, I'm, the next version of this, I'm going to put a camera inside of it as well. I was thinking a uh, rear-facing camera. So you can do like those, um, whatchamacallit, the virtual reality type stuff. Yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so here's other portable display options. So you have a composite display, which is horrible graphics. That's like your old cathode, cathode ray tube. CP TVs use that. Um, it is fast, refresh-wise, but you also need a back converter from um, composite back to your LCD signal if you're using an LCD panel. HDMI is better quality and faster. This is what I would recommend if you're just using your Raspberry Pi for general purpose stuff. Hook it up to an HDMI TV or an HDMI monitor in your set. But you need something which has an HDMI input, and most LCD panels don't, so you have to have a daughter board which converts from HDMI to LCD, which has to be powered. The display itself has to be powered. Um, SPI is a good hack. So if you've seen any of the little cute displays which plug into the GPIO pins that they sell at like Adafruit or other places, those probably are the SPI hack. Um, as I mentioned, it's like a high-speed serial bus, so it actually is fast enough to transmit graphics, which is great. 
but only at about 10 to 15 frames per second, which is not so great. So if you're emulating like Atari games, like Commodore games, great. <laughs> They're slow, so you'll be fine. If you're emulating like Nintendo or Super Nintendo or any of the later gaming systems, you, you're, you're going at much faster refresh rates. The Nintendo was, um, anyone want to guess at what the refresh rate was? Take a guess. How many frames per second did the classic Nintendo run at? I'll give you a hint. It's higher than 15. <laughs> yeah. Yes! All right, give that guy a prize. So it was either 60 if you're in the um, US, or it was 50 if you're in Europe with PAL, because PAL is 25. Well, it's 25 frames per second interlaced, so you have to actually do 50 frames per second, and you end up with odd and even lines every 25. Um, okay, yeah, so you need you need like 60 frames per second to actually accurately emulate it. Um, the Adafruit Kippa and the device tree support is a good hack to accomplish this with a fast, um, low power option. And what this does is it, it hijacks most of your GPIO pins to transmit display data, um, just like they were LCD pins. So you're remapping your GPIO pins into the LCD pins for the display. Um, and you use this device tree support will let you override where the, B the Broadcom pins are mapped to the Raspberry Pi pins. And um, you can even power the display right off of the Raspberry Pi's five volts, so no need for a extra power or like a 12 volt power. A lot of the other, like a composite display, if you hook it up, you need a 12 volt power source for the back converter and the display itself. Um, you also have touch support via USB. The only disadvantage is, so remember we talked about these guys, I squared C, U, R, S, P, I? No, none of those. You have exactly six regular on-off pins left over. Okay, so how many pins do you need to emulate a keyboard, a gamepad, like, like that one? How many pins would you need? Six? Eight. Who said eight? Okay, another prize for him. Yeah, so we have A and B, start and select, and then wah, four directional buttons, unfortunately. So this is, this is not very happy. Okay, this is um, a PowerPoint syndrome. This is, this is what power, how a PowerPoint tells you it's having a, a bad day is it um it stops playing your your videos until you reboot it which is uh, anyone guess which company made <laughs> powerpoint <laughs> yeah yeah those those guys who the, an the answer to everything at that company is reboot your computer not 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 like linux okay and, and it's going to work perfectly this time watch so um when my daughter first played, I told you she first played Mario on the, the little Richard Pie. She, she beat the castle stage. She's like, oh, dad, look, look. She's like, oh, look. The princess is in here. This is horrible. Like, why would they tell me this? Because you do all this work, and you're supposed to, you know, you know modern video games, what you get when you do, when you do something, when you collect a power up, when you like beat a level, there's fireworks, and there's like dancing, there's like lots of positive reinforcement because you've you've accomplished something. This is not positive reinforcement. But this was how classic retro games were. They were they were mean, they kicked your ass, you ran out of lives, you started from the beginning, it was great. Good 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 toughening up of <laughs> our generation. Um yeah, and that's how I felt when I when I realized I didn't have enough GPIO pins. So this was my my hack solution. I stuck a couple diodes in and did something sneaky. Anyone want to guess what my sneaky trick was? Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, prize for this guy. So when you press the start button, it 
sends a signal through the left and the right channel. So it's like you're simultaneously plessing left and right, which is not a legal, it's not a legal, um, you know, move, like a not a legal input. So this is, this is my, this is my clever track. The other, the other way you can do this is you can implement a keyword matrix with like rows and columns. And then that gives you for like our six GPIO, we could easily get nine, nine inputs. Um, possibly more if we if we switched input and output pins and did tricks with those, but this this is clever and it works in most cases. There's one case where it doesn't work, and that is when you want to have a game which requires pressing like left and start at the same time, because when you press start, that presses left and right, and when you press left, now it doesn't do anything. And most games don't have this as a valid input except for one game which uh, my buddy Andrew Hoffman told me about which is Mike Tyson's punch out for the special moves you like slam start or select and like at directional arrows or something weird and it yeah okay so don't play that game but the rest of the games it's it works great um, this is the rat's nest wiring of um, my prototype which was on a breadboard um, as we as we discovered last night this is not professional <laughs> I was, I was, I was told off by one of the jug members, and he was right. You should never wire your breadboard like this because we have, we have multiple um, pins mapped to the same headers here, right? So this is this is this this was like a mistake made like 30 years ago when they made electronics, and it re decreases the reliability because then you have brittle connections here. Um, so don't ever do this. But I was trying to avoid creating a, um, a circuit board, a printed circuit board. The right way of doing this is to create a printed circuit board and then have that manufactured and insert that into the case. Um, I was using the Kippa as kind of a cheap circuit board to solder multiple connections to the same thing. Um, so this is the button layout. Uh, this is the painful process of getting multiple things soldered to the same, the same pad. Um, in retrospect, I would recommend twisted pair wire instead of trying to do it with solid cord wire. Solid cord is much harder to do this with. Um, I'd also recommend heat shrink wrapping for separation because this also has a tendency to touch, which is not good for your pie when you have like ground and power touching. Um, I have, in the making of the retro pie, I have destroyed two pies so far. <laughs> One in the initial creation and one when I was trying to fix the LCD cable and I I got lazy and I left the power on and I unplugged it and plugged it back in a couple times. Not a good idea. Um, I have some badly burnt electronics components as a result. Uh, but this actually this actually works. So this is a working emulator with the keyboard and the um, screen. All right, so I'm going to go on to software. But any questions about the hardware, the electronics before I switch to software? And remember, questions get you prizes. No, no, nothing yet. Okay. So the emulator, so the emulator, as I mentioned, is Java. Um, so it's a Java-based NES emulator written by Andrew Hoffman, who he works down for the um, University of California, Irvine. He's a great guy, um, kind of has been pottering off on this in his spare time for the past five years or so. And his goal is to create a, an accurate emulator written in Java. So he wasn't really focused on performance, just accurate emulation. Um, which he's accomplished, and it runs really fast on desktop, as you saw. Like you can get up to thousands of frames per second on your average your average PC. Um, setting up a remote platform for debugging. So I was using NetBeans, and I'd highly recommend if you're doing performance debugging on the Raspberry Pi, um, set it up for remote execution, and then you can use your tooling to directly connect to it pretty easily. Um, this is how you run something on the Raspberry Pi. You just have to. Choose your runtime platform you set up in the previous one, and then choose your main class. Arguments are optional, VM options are optional. I was, in this case, this is the um, game it's going to run. This is a nice homebrew game to try yourself called Love Story. And the VM options, these are here so, um, so I can do use J input, which is a, um, a library for USB controllers. So you can actually plug a USB controller up to this and run the game off a USB controller. Is it still working? Why is nobody playing games? That's that's a travesty. See if you can get a, a game on there. Um, okay, and then we have a working game system. So, anyone want to guess 
how many frames per second we're at when we pick the default code base and just run it on the Raspberry Pi. And let's let's say a uh, Raspberry Pi 2, for argument's sake, because I, I don't have a 3 to try it on yet. More than 15. Okay, no prize for that answer. <laughs> try, try again. What? Okay, 60 is also more than 15. Definitely no prize for that one. Anyone else? Okay, well, less than 15. It's about six. Six. Yeah. So, not so, not so good. Um, the the problem is he you know he tuned it for desktop. Raspberry Pis are not desktops; they're embedded computers. Um, Java is actually pretty fast. There's actually the default Java runtime is a full Java SE implementation. It includes a JIT compiler, so it actually gets um, optimization as it runs. Um, you'll notice this in the startup of the application when you first start it; it's a little bit slower, and as it JITs and it like tunes code, it like speeds up. Um, so it only takes like about five or ten seconds to get to peak performance. Um, so anyway, I, I did a lot of evaluation. You can just, once you have your Raspberry Pi set up for remote debugging, you can go NetBeans and run the profiler directly, which is super easy. Um, and then these are the, some of the performance bottlenecks I discovered. So um, the, the big one was the swing video. Um, so when you do swing on the Raspberry Pi, it actually has to run in X windows. And so you have swing graphics, which are so-so performance-wise. Swing, swing's actually quite slow if you don't have precisely matching um, graphics, graphics types that you're writing to. If the buffer you're writing to is like set up for maybe 24-bit RGB, and the, the display buffer underneath it expects 32-bit RGB, then it, it spends a lot of time mashing bits and doing stuff to get the right color graphics. But even once you fix those issues, it's still relatively slow because it has to go through X windows, and then X windows goes down to the underlying graphics hardware. So I rewrote the code to use. What, 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 anyone know another graphics framework that works with Java? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right, that's that's worth the prize right there. Very good, very good, Hendrik. Yeah, so I rewrote the code to use JavaFX. And JavaFX on the Raspberry Pi uses um, the direct frame buffer support, so it doesn't even go through X windows. And it also has 3D acceleration, so it makes use of the GPU for accelerating graphics performance. The Raspberry Pi has a horrible, well, relatively horrible CPU compared to a desktop, but quite a good GPU. Um, the graphics processing unit's very fast. You can play like full full screen HDMI video, 1080p video, without a problem on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so once you switch that over, that sped it up quite a bit. Um, there were some issues with the performance doing when it was doing per pixel rendering. A older version of his code base used per line rendering, which is slightly less accurate, but it requires a lot less synchronization. So I broke compatibility with some games, but it did speed up things quite a bit doing per line emulation. Um, this was actually the single biggest performance improvement was he had a bunch of bitwise helper functions where to, to swizzle bits, he'd call a function, pass in the bit, the, the long, pass in the byte he wanted to set or unset or check, and then it would you know set or check a value, return the value. And that was extremely slow compared to just using bit masks. And it was also done in a way where it was hard for it to inline it, so the compiler couldn't inline it easily. Um, extracting PPU operations helped quite a bit, because this, this actually is a big bottleneck, all the pixel <laughs> operations. The audio processing unit was doing a bunch of doubles. Um, and if you could replace those with longs, it was much faster, because the floating point units in the Raspberry Pi are not as fast as a desktop FPU. In general, floating point units are quite bad for performance, because they force things to go into a single threaded. There's usually like one FPU path through processors and then things just wait for it. Uh, array access via unsafe. This did not help actually. Um, so you can, does anyone know what unsafe is? Is anyone? Oh, okay. So in the center. Explain to us. Give, give them the mic and explain to us what, what unsafe is. 
unsafe are those a APIs which you will remove in Java 9, which are uh, <laughs> which you should not use. Yes, very <laughs> which good. Are, which do low-level hardware access properly. Yeah, yeah. So don't use it. Yeah, don't use it. Actually, it doesn't help. And it, it actually it actually doesn't help. Um, so I was trying to avoid array access bounce checks, and it it turns out that the JIT compiler optimizes them out anyway. It didn't matter. Um, so you can actually you can actually find out what's happening by using a tool like JIT Watch and actually like checking checking what gets done by the JIT compiler to to find out the details. Um, I was also using some tools for checking garbage collection as well. So runtime garbage collection performance. You can see when the garbage collector is running and what it's doing. Um, and yeah, I wasn't using JitWatch at the time, although I did chat with the JitWatch guy after it. There's another mode you can turn on to get JIT, JIT output. So you can have the compiler tell you when it's JITting things and what it's doing and how it's inlining things. Uh, so that's quite helpful as well. Um, this also was not that helpful, replacing loops with system array copy because they're an intrinsic for it. But the last one was the pulse width modulation audio. So what I did there is since the audio buffer flushing is slow on the Raspberry Pi, I only flush audio once every three to four frames. So it slightly delays sound effects, but not noticeably. But it gives you a big performance improvement because you're not constantly flushing the audio buffer every frame. OK, and then the last thing is 3D printing we're going to talk about. But any questions about the software before we move on? Okay, so 3D printing, which this is this is the fun, the fun part. How many people own a 3D printer? Okay, well we we have to improve that. Why why don't you have a 3D printer, Henry? Garrett has one. <laughs> yeah, Garrett Garrett has exactly this 3D printer. Yeah. Um, is there is there a maker lab in in Dortmund? Or no, yeah, maybe. So one of the things to to um one of the, one of the easy ways to get access to a three D printer is if there's a university or a maker lab or something in the vicinity, they'll often let you borrow it, and you can try three D printing. And usually they maintain it; they have people who know how to operate it, so it's a good way to kind of print stuff out, try it. Um. The way that these printers work, for those of you who have never seen one before, is they, they basically they, they have a big reel of plastic. And it goes through a tube, and it melts the plastic at the hot end. And when the plastic is molten at around 210, uh, 190 degrees and up, then you can extrude it and then you know draw. And then it melts quickly and then gets hard, and it, it forms into a solid mass again. So it gives you precise control with a small nozzle to actually draw things. And then you draw it layer by layer, and you go up, 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 up. And it works wonderfully as long as you factor into your design constraint that you know you have a limited build volume for the size of what you can print. You have to have layers which are supported. If you draw in the air, it's very messy. Um, so you always want to make a, a, a model which has no overhangs. You don't want any areas where it's like printing in midair. Uh, but it's lo lots of fun, and I would recommend if you're looking for a 3D printer, pr 3D printers have gotten much more affordable. You can get reasonably good ones around 1000 plus. This one is 2000 plus, but it's quite good. Um, and you can get kits. There's actually, the Ultimaker 1 is a kit version of this, and it's, it's a, you know, I don't know, 1000 plus something. I, I forget what the price is. But you can get kits and build it yourself as well. Although I'd recommend if you've never done 3D printing, buy an assembled one. That way you have a higher chance of it printing. <laughs> um, and then make sure you get a printer which has a good community around it because you're going to run into issues. It'll jam. It'll, you'll have issues printing certain types of material. There'll be all sorts of problems. So you want a good community to ask questions to. And also one that has an open design where you can find out how it's built and take it apart and put it back together. I've probably taken this entire printer apart piece by piece um, and put it back together several times now. So it's all good fun. And then, of course, once you have a printer, you need things to print. So you have to do some modeling. So that for the modeling, I'm using a software called Fusion 360 from Autodesk. 
Um, you can also use Google SketchUp, or you can use like um, JavaFX SCAD, which is or uh, which is a, a Java-based. Um, you can write Java code and des design your 3D printing mod, mod pr 3D printing model. OpenSCAD is like a another weird language which does the same thing, but of course you want to use a Java version. Um, but the reason I used Fusion 360 is because most professional designers they they use either SolidWorks which is the industry standard, or this, Fusion 360. And um, for doing designs where you have to like tweak the design and you want to be able to visually see what you're doing, these tools are a lot better. It's kind of a mix between uh, most 3D modeling tools. You, you're you modifying a model, but you don't have a full history you can edit. And most programming tools, you're actually designing a program so you can you can edit the history, like you can edit how it's built, but you don't have good visualization tools to kind of see it. With this tool, there's actually, it's, it's not visible in this picture, but there's a whole history. I, I think I ended up with around three or 400 steps. You can go back to any previous step, like where you've defined the um, schematics, and you can edit the dimensions, and it'll recalculate the whole model from that point forward, based on all the things you've done. It's not foolproof, it often gets stuck or screws up, but um, it's a lot faster than redoing the model from scratch, and it's a lot cleaner than trying to fix things by editing the last version of the model, because then it gets very confusing. Like if you had, if I had 400 steps that were clean, where I did it, I went back and I edited the previous steps to make it correct. You can imagine if you build something like this by just editing the last version, you would have like, you know, hundreds of thousands of steps to tweak this, tweak that modify the, the chamfers. Um, Autodesk Fusion is also free for students and for hobbyists. So professional people who use it every day, you have to pay them like, I don't know, some exorbitant price, a few thousand dollars. Um, but they realize that students and hobbyists don't actually use it that much. They're just experimenting. So if you're not making any money, you can apply for a startup license. Um, as a hobbyist, and that basically means you know use it for free until you make money and then pay them back. Um, and you know, for most of us, we're never going to actually build something which we sell commercially. Um, and then also students, they give free licenses too as well. So I think it's it's reasonable. And of course, if you if you make if you come up with the next Kickstarter project and you're rich, you know, pay for your license <laughs> out of your millions of dollars you've collected for Kickstarter. This is the inside of the model. Um, so it's designed to be printed without any supports. And so I had to split the model up into multiple sections so that it can kind of, you print them separately and you insert them and layer them on top of each other. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to design like this to make it printable easily, but once you do it, it makes it easier for people to reproduce it. Um, it's also designed to go together with no screws. So like these little tabs here, those click into the top of the case. So the case closes nice and tight. Um, these tabs right here, those um, go horizontally. So it's kind of a horizontal ridge it snaps into. So the combination of like, like vertical and horizontal supports makes it extremely tight. Like you'll notice the case, the case doesn't open easily. It doesn't fall apart, it's not loose, even though there's no screws holding it together. But you can open it up. You can just, if you know the right orientation to, to wedge it. So, you know, don't, don't try this, but the, you want to lift from the front and pop the front, and it'll just pop open. Uh, but when you're playing it, you're normally not putting pressure on it that direction. Um, this was one of the biggest challenges was doing these little hinges. So here's, these are all failed hinges. <laughs> um, I, I figured it was faster just to print little hinges and then wrench them with this thing and test them out rather than trying to print a whole case to test just a hinge. Um, and it was, it was, yeah, this was hard. Anyone, anyone play Zelda too? Okay, this this game was hard too. Not not it's not it's not one of the top hardest games ever, but in terms of Nintendo games like like happy Nintendo games which are supposed to be for kids, this one was pretty annoying. Um, and this is the hinge design I came up with. It's two triangles, which are slightly different sizes. So one's bigger and one's smaller. 
Um, and what, it, what, what the shape you end up with is this kind of like an oblong triangle like this, right? So it's not a full circle. It's a slightly like a triangle with rounded edges. Um, now, they're, they're really close. Like this is like a, a fraction of a millimeter. So it's really, it's really close. And it mostly, it's a mostly a circle. It mostly turns. But when you hit, um, when, you, when, you, when you're off alignment, it's a, it bends the plastic slightly. And when you go back on alignment, then it snaps in place. You'll notice like it, it's happy in that position, right? Open. It's happy when it's closed. If you shut the if you shut the top, you'll notice it kind of shuts nicely and it stays shut. And there's a third position where it's happy, which is, well, you can't do it, but you'd have to open it 120 degrees the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in between, it's it's slightly bending the plastic. And the nice thing about this hinge design for plastic is plastic is flexible, so it'll flex slightly and it'll return to the original shape. Where if you tried to do a hinge, which was, for example, if you tried to do a hinge with hard edges, like a, a polyhedron, then as you rotate the polyhedron a few times, those hard edges turned into smooth edges. Because plastic, you know, any hard edges you rub on with plastic will rub off, and you end up with a perfect circle. This one, this, this one's been open and closed, I don't know, thousands of times now. And it still retains the properties that it can, it can bend and flex and return to the original position. So this... Obviously, this is not what you would do if you were designing a professional gaming system like Nintendo. They have metal hinges. You can actually buy them from China. Um, but I figured if you're designing something like, you know, design something which fits the materials. So this is, this is the best design I could come up with, which makes sense in plastic. And um, don't expect people to buy any esoteric components. So you, you, you need the electronics. Those, you can't build those yet. You can't manufacture Raspberry Pis at home yet. But everything else, there's no screws required. There's no hinges required. It's all printed. And this, whenever I go on Thingiverse and I pick out projects to build, whenever I get a project that looks really cool and it has like a two-page list bill of materials for things I need to buy, like special metric screws and special little connectors, I'm like, too much trouble. So this is, this is something you guys could, you know, you could build, you could print, and you could build it. Like, like you should have one. <laughs> Tell Garrett to print you a case. He he has exactly the same printer as me. Tell him to print you a case, then assemble it. Okay. So, <laughs> here's here's the interference diagram for the um the the hinge, and this is at the the wrong angle, so 60 degrees off where it should be, and you can see that there's exactly 28.254 cubic millimeters of interference. Um, so if, if the plastic doesn't bend, it would be overlapping by that amount. And, you know, I, I have the original models posted online, but um, this, this seemed to work the best. I tried a bunch of different values. This was like the magic number. Um, but depending upon your printer, you could tweak this slightly to get a, a stiffer hinge or a looser hinge. You don't want it too stiff or it'll break. You don't want it too loose or it, it's kind of, you know, floppy. Um, this is... Cura, the software used to take the models and convert them to G-code, which is what the printer uses to print. Those are the instructions for the print head. Um, this is op open source software made by the Ultimaker guys. It's pretty nicely done. Um, and some other printer manufacturers also use this and recommend it. Um, you can also use Slicer, or your favorite Slicer of choice that comes with your printer is recommended. But again, I'd recommend open source software rather than proprietary software whenever you can. This is the actual printer printing out the base, um, a full bed of the um, you know top case and the um, the pins and the things holding it together. Um, this is everything laid out. So in total, let's see how we are counting. How many pieces <laughs> are there? Eleven. Okay. No, you're wrong. Who said 11? <laughs> okay, prize for that guy. 11. Yes, there are 11, there are 11 pieces. We, we actually we counted this last night, so that's why I know. <laughs> or two nights ago. Two nights ago. Um, this, this one is the D-pad. So that's, how, that's the printed D-pad. Although, you'll notice my D-pad's a different color. I cheated. So I, I printed that particular D-pad. And it's, it's interesting to notice the difference between the D-pad and the rest of the case. 
I printed it on a um, stereolithographic printer. This is the way stereolithographic printers, if you've seen them, they, they have a pool of um, resin that's essentially liquid plastic. And they use ultraviolet light, either via laser or a projector, to then harden the plastic in layers. And it, the, it's printed upside down, and it pulls it out of the plastic layer by layer. So it's really cool. Um, Michael Hoffer has one of these. <laughs> um, and it it it's a much smaller print volume and it's much messier to deal with because you have chemicals rather than plastic but the advantage of the stereolithographic printers is they're extremely detailed and you get much smoother surfaces so for this application, I, I tried printing it several times with different settings in um, a standard fused deposition model printer, like the Ultimaker. And the problem is, it, it to the touch, the layers feel rough. And you'll, you'll notice this if you feel the side of the case. Like, it's, it's got a rough texture, because as the layers get printed, each layer has little, like, edges, little square edges. Uh, the stereolithographic printer prints smooth. So it's both slightly higher resolution in the X and Y direction. The Z direction is the same, but the X and Y direction is higher resolution. And it's also, um, since it prints from a vat, and you use chemicals to remove the extra resin, it tends to smooth things slightly. So you end up with slightly higher resolution and then smoother surfaces. And for this application, that's perfect, because you want a smooth button feel. But you know, you can, you can use a standard button a standard printer and print it. And it'll, it'll match your case color too, so that's kind of nice. Um, okay, so the buttons, I sp kind of splay the, the leads so it fits flatter. And then I do something else very unprofessional. Don't Never do this at home. Well, except if you're building the retro pipe. Don't, don't do this at home. I, I wire leads together. If you're doing this yourself, make sure to get both metal connections hot so you don't get a cold solder joint. Um, and it's tricky. It's trickier to do with two wires than it is to do when you're soldering onto a PCB, because you actually need to get both of these wires very hot by getting the soldering iron full contact on both wires. So if you flow like a little solder on the tip first, and then get them both really hot, and then put your solder and then release, then they'll stay really tight. Um, if you don't, when you yank on them, you get a cold joint and it comes apart, and you try again. It's no big deal. Um, wiring the button wiring the, putting in the Raspberry Pi. Um, these two cables on the side of the Raspberry Pi are for the audio. I wired directly to the pads on the bottom of the Raspberry Pi because there's not enough room to stick a jack in the, the audio port here. Um, the battery, which lasts, how, how long do you think the battery lasts? Yes, this is a big fat one, it's a 4,000 milliamp hour battery. Something monstrous. Just take a guess, I mean. Oh, oh, six. All right. Prize. <laughs> six and a half hours. Well, that, I think at six hours, the low battery light turns on, so you're, you're, you're as correct as you can be for guessing. <laughs> um, this was my daughter's requirement, actually. So the size of the battery was chosen based on my daughter's requirements, because initially I was going to use a 2400 milliamp hour battery. And I... It only gives you like maybe three hours, two to three hours of runtime, and she's like, "No, no, Dad. <laughs> it has to it has to last a full car ride, or it's not good enough. So at least six hours, or I'm not going to be happy." And so we put we designed a bigger battery into the case as a result. Um, this is the um, Adafruit Power 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 Boost. And what it does is it supplies power to the Raspberry Pi. It charges the battery. It has a micro HDMI port on the side where you can charge the battery and power the Raspberry Pi simultaneously. And it has indicator lights for charging, low battery, out of battery, like everything. It's like wonderful. Um, so if you notice on the back of it, I actually put little cutouts on the case, little like thinner pieces of plastic where I print less. So the lights will show through the case. Um, so when you're charging, you get little lights. And when stuff is happening, you can actually see what's, what's happening on the, on the back of the case. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
Um, and this is more wires and, and stuff before it's assembled. And then um, these are the little plastic things I mentioned to keep the components centered. So they're printed separately and just inserted into the case. One there and then one on top. Um, this is the speaker hooked up to a little audio board which hooks up to the Raspberry Pi. Um, you can use this for other projects as well if you need a little speaker. It's really, really handy also from Adafruit. Everything here is from Adafruit except for these two buttons. Those two buttons um, I got from DigiKey because I couldn't find a good tactile feel button from Adafruit. Um, this one's tricky to assemble, but not as tricky as the original design. So you have to get this ribbon cable, coil it up, pull it through with your fingers. Um, the, originally I had these things closed and you had to go up over out with you know, just a little tiny slit. And I, I tried for hours with pliers and I destroyed a cable and gave up. If, uh, if I couldn't do it, then it needed to be redesigned. So then I cut big holes. Um, unfortunately, this might need a redesign, but you guys notice the hole in the front, right? The, the crack. So that, that was also my, my daughter's testing. QA, quality assurance work. She um, closed the case and it got a little stuck. She was like, oh. And the lip, the lip of the cover was caught under the closed mechanism when she jammed it, and then it just flew off. Um, so I probably, I probably need to create a um, like a little reverse lip, which you can like snap it in place, so the the lip doesn't pop up and down occasionally. Oh, I think pizza's here. This is good timing as well. Um, okay, and then this cable goes up into here. So even if you break the cable, you can just buy a replacement extension cable. You don't have to replace the expensive LCD cable, which is attached to the screen. Um, these pins are the ones with the funky, um, like oblong triangle shape one I was talking about. And they also have a little slot here in the side, which is where you insert the pins when you, um, lock it in place. So like I said, everything's toolless. You just, you know, plug it together, stick these in from the top. And then these are locked in by the display. When you put the display, when you put the display in place, it actually keeps the pins from coming out as well. Um, these guys you remove. So um, there's two places I put in supports right here and right here, because when you're printing, it would peel up slightly. It would work, but it would be slightly misshapen. So adding a few supports here makes it print better, and you just take pliers or your fingers and rip them off at the end. And um, this is like the top of the case. It just slides down from the top. Um, so there's a little, little rail system inside of it, and then you have your finished retro pie. Okay, so we've got um, our final video clip. Anyone beat Metroid? No, no. This, this is one of my favorite games. It was like one of those open-ended games where you could go anywhere, but you really couldn't because you needed power-ups to get there. So there were there were two endings, though, like the, the regular ending if you just didn't get everything, and the, the good ending if you got everything. And in the good ending, you see you found out that unlike most video games at the time, this video game actually had a main female character as the lead. So, you know, if you play Super Smash Brothers, they actually give you the choice of playing either character. You can play Samus with the suit or without the suit. So I think this is, a, this is a good role model for getting more more women programmers and gamers and you know like like my like my daughter who's a budding a budding hacker she helps me with my kids workshops when she's in a good mood not always there, there there's her playing the game again okay so you can find the um, instructions for all this stuff on Thingiverse um, so I've published all the models and all the code and full instructions for how to assemble the case and the soldering lot diagram, like everything. You can just, you know, check it out and build it from this. Um, if, if, you're, if you're feeling generous to, not me, not to me, to my publisher, because they make all the money, then you could pick up this book, which it's also in this book, Raspberry Pi with Java. Um, you'll notice this cover is different than, grab a book out of, the, out of the bag. This cover looks different than the one which was actually printed. <laughs> Any, anyone want to guess why? why? Why do you think the cover the cover here looks different than the cover on the, the official book? All right, tell, to, tell them who the publisher is. <laughs> 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 
Yes, that's the right answer. So yeah, we, we had to change the cover design, I guess, to make them happy. But we, we got Duke on the cover, which is the first for an Oracle Press title. So we made we made small, small progress on on getting things to work. Oh, well, we have it as a prize today, too. Yeah, so we're giving this one away. So to decide who gets it, I'm going to ask you guys a very challenging question. And then whoever whoever answers right gets the book. Okay, so earlier we, we talked about like the, the hack with the diodes and the left and right and start things. Okay, so does anyone know the electrical reason why you would use diodes in that circuit? as opposed to resistors or what are, what are capacitors or, you know, you can stick other things. Like why, why would you stick a diode in there at all? Why would you just straight wire it? Ah, oh, okay, give it a try. I think you wired re left and right together and if you push one of them, if you don't have a diode, uh, the current from the left button would uh, go through the right button as well. Very good, okay. Give that man a book. And everyone give him a round of applause. Yeah, so I, I, I'd actually forgotten how diodes work myself, so I had to look them up. <laughs> but I, I, knew, I knew there was a way to make the circuit work. Um, and the diodes give you essentially current protection, right? It, current flows one way through a diode, not the other way. And based on the size of the diode, you can control how much backflow current there is. Um, but these are the ones I used are standard, standard electronic diodes used for most, you know, Five volt, low voltage circuits, and I believe you can also get those from Adafruit as well. They they sell packs of those diodes. Okay, so thank you guys very much for for watching our presentations today, and also the live stream. You can you can follow the live stream at nighthacking.com. We added a new feature to the live stream today too. Let's let's show you guys the cool new the cool new live stream feature. So um, guess. Guess where we are right now? Well, you don't see so you don't have to guess anymore because on the, the Night Hacking Tour website it tells you we're we're right in Dortmund. So as as we're driving around Germany on motorcycle, this will this is updated real time and it it actually uses my my phone. Um, and there's a, Johan Voss wrote a Java version of this for, for doing the app tracking. Um, and then it sends it to a server. And then I pull down a, a website with the current location. So you can, you can watch us on the Audubon going faster than we should be. <laughs> All right, so any questions or is there pizza? Yeah, now we'll save questions for later. Let's get some pizza. <laughs> All right, thank you guys.